Commander Mike Hawke has come to meet his submarine. For the last two months, HMS Repulse has been hidden from the world, under the sea on Polaris patrol. For the next six weeks, Repulse will be checked, tested, maintained, painted and stored. Then she will leave the Clyde submarine base at Faslane and Hawke will take her back to sea for another patrol. Repulse is one of Britain's four Polaris submarines. There are seldom more than one of them on patrol at once. So for eight weeks at a time, Repulse and its nuclear missiles can represent the sum total of the nation's independent deterrent. Welcome, Hello, Mike. How are you? Nice to see you. Unlike any other ship in the Royal Navy, each Polaris submarine has two captains and two complete crews who change over immediately after each patrol. This double crew system means the submarine can be kept at sea for as much of the year as possible without overstressing the men who must spend eight weeks at a time shut inside this cramped world. We've had the most extraordinarily good patrol, actually. It's just, um, just at no time really have I really thought to myself, help, we've got a problem here. And um, certainly over the last two or three days, I've had the opportunity to swim around quite a lot. And um, everything works. She flies extremely well. <laughs> Repulse is huge, longer than Wembley football pitch. But so much space is taken up with weapons and machinery that it's still a squeeze for the 160 strong crew. For the newcomer, it's a daunting maze. There's enough room, though, for some of the older naval traditions. Bring the silver tankers out. Should be 13 in all. The fresh crew checks everything during the changeover. Even whether the silver collection in the chintz upholstered wardroom is still all there. Anyway, would you like a gin and tonic, sir? No, I will go on. Thank Fine. you very much for hospitality, but I will go on. Are you going to be wearing that? I am. I, I'm not, because I haven't got one here. Mine's gone up in board. I'll be formal and you can relax. <laughs> with, along with my teddy bear. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Teddy bear under the arm. Thank Thank you. Go. At last, the changeover is finished. Now Hawke can take command of the most powerful ship in the Royal Navy. Right. Right side. For the new crew, there's a difficult decision to make. Once the submarine leaves for patrol, they're stuck underwater for at least eight weeks. So most decide not to be told of any domestic tragedy until the end of the patrol. The frustration of knowing that a child had died, for instance, yet not being able to return home, could drive a man insane. At Naval Headquarters in London, the machinery for that next patrol slips quietly into motion. All submarines are shrouded in secrecy, 
but Polaris submarines are especially carefully protected. Repulse's orders are flown by special courier to Faslane. Mike Hawke is the only person on the submarine allowed to read them. Well, the classification of them, obviously, for the, for the security of the country, is chosen to ensure that only those who really do need to know the information that's in them are the people who actually receive those orders. It's a very restricted number, obviously. They contain the instructions to me from my commander-in-chief and what he wishes me to do and where he intends that I should go to and when I shall return at the end of my time. And that information is uh, of such security classification that it need become sealed orders to me, to my eyes only. Nestling under the 16 black hatches are the nuclear missiles that create the need for this special secrecy. Each has a range of 2,500 miles and multiple warheads 48 times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. So Repulse has awesome firepower, but it must remain invisible when it's on patrol. If the Soviet Union could find out where it was, by tracking the submarine, for instance, when it leaves Faslane, it would be worthless as a deterrent. So everything about Repulse is top secret. When it leaves, when it returns, where it goes, what it does. When people ask you things, you know, people leave me on trains and all that at home, they ask you things. You say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't say that, anything about that. They think you've been a bit petty <coughs> and you feel a bit, oh, you know, he thinks I'm being stupid. But uh, it's best not saying nothing. You might think you're just talking about something that's been in the paper and, you know, you end up blotting off a couple of, you know, extra adding dits, like, you know, mm. which, you know, can drop you in it. They, you know, they can put little bits together. And I mean, if you've got a thousand little bits, it makes one, you know, one big bit. And that's, how the, that's the way they work. You hear stories about these, these women getting sailors yeah. in the beds. Yeah. All this pillow talk. I've never had one myself. <laughs> Still waiting. Polaris submarines are the only ones whose crew includes a qualified doctor. Illness must not be allowed to force the submarine to surface and reveal its position whilst on patrol. Surgeon Lieutenant Richard Garth can deal with broken bones and will even do minor operations on patrol, like for appendicitis. But in these less than ideal conditions, he would normally use drugs to postpone the operation until the submarine's return. We don't have a proper operating theatre. We have a, a makeshift operating theatre, which is usually rigged in the senior eights mess. The atmosphere, therefore, won't be as sterile as, as in a normal operating theatre. The chances of infection are that much greater. Uh, we also have the problems of one doctor having to be both an anaesthetist and doctor. It would really have to be done under local anaesthetic, which would make it an, an unpleasant procedure and uh, it can be a difficult operation anyway and should things go wrong there is no backup so if someone became too ill for the doctor to treat would Hawke abort the patrol and leave Britain without its deterrent well I'm afraid I'm gonna have to dodge that question uh, and say that I can't answer it uh, there are rules laid down for me to react to certain conditions but I'm afraid I must say no more than that should someone die we would have to keep their body until we return to Faz Lane. The place we would store it would probably be the, the deep freeze, so food would have to be moved to make way. And once we got alongside, the body could be taken off for post-mortem examination. It looks bigger, actually, it's yeah. safe, doesn't it? It's great. There are now three weeks to go before patrol. Today is family's day. It's amazing to think what they can get in it, really. 
give a good tight grip when you go down the ladder, just slope away a bit, and then it goes the other way. For some, it will be their first glimpse inside a submarine. For most, their first experience of diving. I don't know what it's going to feel like, if it's going to feel like you're going up in a plane, but you're going down, or what? Whether everything's going to sort of go down to the back, or up to the front, or whichever way it goes down. OK, would you like to pass your bag down? Yes. Take your bag out of the way, that's it. <laughs> Would you like to see the RS so he knows who's on board, please? Right. Quite looking forward to it, really. I'm not scared. <coughs> but it's just this that puts me off. <laughs> 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 Zero, he's on the right depth. Yeah. If you can hear a diesel engine on a special bearing, you know, say 340, 330, then all you're going to do is put them here, the bearing of the contact. So if you've got when you fire a missile, if you've got an empty tube of missile yeah. in it, yeah. so when yeah. you fire it, that. that water is coming back in, so to blow water out, you can see it back up to a level. Yeah. Why have they got off and up those two squares? Off and up. There. You've been up here all the time, yes. <laughs> I, I get too sick down top. below. <laughs> Do you know where we are? No. No, no all I see now is sky. <laughs> That's right. That's what I see. Isn't that? Yes. That you, and that goes in quite a I was surprised at the actual size of the submarine, the overall size is, is so large, but so much of the space inside it is taken up with their machinery. Um, the very tiny space they have for showers and toilets, <laughs> very little privacy of their own, very small cabins and what have you. That would be the worst thing for me if I had to spend eight weeks on board. Hey? Yeah. On the top. All right, everybody in the control room, please, if I can have your attention for a second. While we're diving, I'll be very grateful if all of you kept absolute silence, except for the proper reports coming through from the proper people. Once we're safely underwater, OK, the chat can start again. Wait until I go off your feet, sir, Fred. Right, first time, dive the submarine. Carry on and dive the submarine, all right, so flight diving now. Open, one, two, three, main bits. Oh, one, two, three, main bits. Diving down. One, two, three, main one, two, three, we missed the camera, sir. Thank you. 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 Discharge 500 gallons, hover system to sea. On depth, 68 feet. Stand by bearings for a fix. Well, well. I don't, know. I, don't, I don't think it's as uh, the experience as it's I expected, really. No, no, it's a very slight sensation of going down. Sue's husband's just said to us, I'm the last person that saw the light of day just now. And in actual fact, it must feel awfully like that when they go. That's right. It's a long time. I think I would need to very be coming and looking up the periscope, seeing daylight. Yes. yes. If only it's, you know, just the horizon to see. Oh, I'd hate to be shut up, I think, for yes. just that long. One afternoon's OK, but uh, I think eight, eight, eight weeks. weeks uh, it's a long time, isn't it? It's a long time to spend. Spending eight weeks at a time underwater can become a bit much. I don't like the, the cramped conditions. I don't like living 
in such close proximity to everybody else and the lack of privacy. Living in a small space with 160 other people means you can never actually get away from people. Radio operator Andy Lucas has managed to get away. He will never go to sea on Repulse or any other submarine again. Yes, please. Oh, Lucas going on draft. On draft. What to? Going to Mercury. Mercury, yeah? Yeah. I like it, don't you? No. When I joined submarines, it was a whole new atmosphere and a, an adventure. It was something different. An experience not many people know about or think about. And I was proud to be able to say, look at me, I'm going on submarines and, I, you know, I'm different from you lot, virtually. And when I got on a submarine, it was, well, it was certainly different than everything. I haven't got a base pass because I'm leaving the base for the last time. That's OK. OK, That's thank you. Things worried me, noises, when I first joined. Noises that you weren't accustomed to. <laughs> Some people just didn't bother about it, just turned over, went back to sleep if they were in bed. But not me, I used to sometimes even get up and check things, you know. The tower leads up to the bridge, the conning tower, as most people call it, and, um, people had to go up and clean it, well, a person, because it's only big enough for one. And I was the one, my cleaning station was the tower, and you can hear the water sometimes going across, and it's not, to my mind, there was never a lot between me and that water. And uh, it did, it sometimes worried you, you know, and you'd see places where bits of water were coming in. Coffin dream is how most people would imagine what it's like to be buried alive. In one instance, I remember I was lying in my bunk space and there's not a lot of room. The curtains were shut and it is pitch black, totally pitch dark. One of the lads was having a wash and he let his hand off the tap rather fast and there was a thud. And I turned around and saw a flash of light at the top of my curtains and that to me in the state it was in, just half and half sleep, half away, it was a steel sheet coming down. And I panicked then. I mean, it was sheer terror, really. A lot of people had coffin dreams on board. But I used to get, well, four or five a week. At first, I tried to see the captain, my divisional officer, my captain, about getting off submarines, but I was told there's no way that I can go off submarines, be let off without doing my time on them. And, um, well, I had three years left to do on submarines, and the captain wasn't prepared to let me go out of the submarine service. I dug a little deeper, and the doctor dug a little deeper, and we found that he was finding that the effect of living in the submarine was bearing down on him. So we had him uh, examined by one of the naval psychiatrists, who said that, yes, he had a problem and he was really not fit for service in submarines. He was such a good lad that, in fact, he's gone back to general service as opposed to uh, going outside and leaving the Navy altogether. Claustrophobia does, in fact, occur very rarely on submarines, only two cases in the past three years. It's sometimes tried as a method of escape by those who discover they dislike the way of life. But the 20% extra pay all submariners receive tends to discourage a return to surface ships. <laughs> Patrol is now only a few days away, although the actual date is still a secret. Repulse has interrupted its working up schedule for a night at anchor off the small town of Rothsey. It's the crew's last opportunity to savour some of the pleasures that'll be missing on patrol. I have a pious hope that this cooling water that you can see bubbling out on the side there, which is the cooling
cooling water from the condensers will attract the fish and being that much warmer than the background. It's a pious hope. I might, I might get something, but um, I doubt it, knowing my luck. Fishing is a hobby I enjoy, but not one I'm very successful at. families, girlfriends, and those last 24 hours at home are hard work because you know that in 24, then it's 23, then it's 22 hours, you've got to be taking that black pig to sea. And suddenly that time's upon you when you've got to say goodbye and know that no matter what, you aren't going to see anything for two months. I haven't sealed on it. Uh, I've been on the submarine. It's claustrophobic, so you can see about it. <laughs> I couldn't live on it. It frightens me to death, and it's an evil-looking thing, I think. I know he's good at his job. I know he doesn't <laughs> like going away. He's, he's been on the boat a long time, and I, I think that's basically the reason why. I'll have a chat. He's grab a few. Did you watch Two days to go. Stores include a ton and a half of beef, a mile of sausages, 60 feature films, and 1,500 gallons of beer. All 160 of Repulse's crew are back from leave. Although for one, the temptations of Rothsey proved irresistible. Where are westward, sir? Off caps. Where are westward, sir? Did I have without leave from 0700 to 0850, namely one hour 50 minutes on the 27th of July, 1983. Westward, do you understand the charge? Sir. Has the accused pleased it earlier? Yes, sir, at my table. When I investigated the case, he pleaded guilty. Does that plea still stand, Westwood? Yes, sir. Have you anything you wish to tell me about the incident? No, I, I just missed the boat, sir. You missed the boat. Division officer, have you anything you wish to say in mitigation? Uh, not so much mitigation, sir, but uh, Westwood has worked very hard in the nav centre and is doing very well. And his missing the Liberty boat seemed rather out of character and came as rather a surprise. When did you join the Navy? November 80, sir. So this is your first offence yes, since joining the Navy. Well, taking that into consideration, Westwood, also taking into consideration that you pleaded guilty, and also the fact that the submarine was under sailing orders, I fine you £35. Fine £35, Coxon. How many paydays, please, sir? Two. Fine £35 recovered over two monthly paydays. On Caps. About turn. Carry on. That's all requested in the
to get out is uh, one of security, get out and get uh, underwater and away to reduce the amount of chance of anybody observing our performance. Who is amongst all these houses around us? Who is in that yacht that sails past you? I don't know. One's got to assume that there's someone. to support the government's deterrent policy and take HMS Repulse away into the oceans of the world and disappear, totally disappear. We all listen out for information being passed to us but remain totally silent and totally lost to the rest of the world. My aim is to spend the time at sea undetected by anybody else, whether he be one of our own country's ships or someone else's. It doesn't matter who they are, I remain undetected. Next week's episode, Polaris Patrol presents a portrait of Repulse on patrol and also examines the life of a Polaris submariner's wife, left behind for eight weeks. Missile compartment of HMS Repulse, one of Britain's four Polaris submarines. These 16 nuclear missiles are Britain's independent deterrent. Patrol for Repulse means two months at walking pace. The submarine moves so slowly because it must make as little noise as possible, noise which might give away its position to listening ships or submarines. To maintain its value as a deterrent, Repulse must try and remain completely undetected, so it won't surface for the entire patrol, but will hide deep in the anonymous wastes of the world's oceans. John, what have you got this afternoon? Uh, it's all very quiet, sir. Just a few fish and the odd whale. No shipping contacts at all, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. The submarine tows a wireless aerial 
which floats to the surface and picks up orders from naval headquarters in London. But Repulse's captain, Commander Mike Hawke, should not transmit a single wireless message during patrol. It could give away the submarine's position. Where Repulse goes on patrol is a closely guarded secret, even to most of its 160 strong crew. Our last fix looks quite good. The navigation center, where the submarine's position is displayed, is out of bounds to all but a dozen men. Just in case any unauthorized person should enter, by accident or by design, the charts are deliberately kept upside down. But the truth is that most of the crew don't care which ocean they're in. Their only reality is the artificial limbo of this crowded, steel-gray world. For a submarine, it's a reasonably comfortable world. There are duty-free cigarettes and beer, up-to-date feature films every day and every night, and plenty to eat. The nuclear power plant, which drives the submarine, also distills enough fresh water for endless hot showers, and the atmosphere is constantly scrubbed clean, although aerosols like shaving foam are forbidden. Their gases might build up over the weeks. But when a patrol's definition of success is that nothing happens for eight weeks, the enemy is not the Soviet Union, but boredom. Well, you've got to have something to take your mind off it. So you, you're there and there's nothing really happening. Basically, it's just help the patrol go by. So they get really boring after a while. Just plodding about, doing the same thing, day in, day out. Time drags, because if you've got a movie which you say, say you've seen before, there's nothing else to do. And if you don't like reading a lot of books and that, then you just sit around doing nothing. Um, and that's when you start drifting away, thinking about life at home and that, what you're missing at home. It's just the way of life that you come to accept. You miss your home all the while. You know, you'd be a fool if you didn't say you didn't. You, know, you, miss, you miss your home, your family, Girlfriend, fiance, wife, or whatever. You, you're missing, you know, you're always thinking of them. Us working in the galley, we see it a lot because we get everybody coming through the counter, you know. I mean, we see it every day, the grumpy ones, you know, until they settle down, like. And then come about week five, they start getting a little bit edgy, like, because they're all hacked off, like, and they've all done enough at sea, like. And uh, come about week six, and it's starting to, it all starts to happen, and they'll start thinking about home, and everybody goes into what we call a glaze. We stand in the galley and watch them. They'll sit there and eat half the meal, and then they'll, they'll just stare at the, the bulkhead there, like, you know. We know what they're thinking, like, they're just thinking about getting back, you know. And it's dead funny. I mean, they'll sit there and they'll look at this bulkhead for about 10, 20 minutes, like, you know. And they'll go back and they'll realize that their scran's freezing. <laughs> You know, you think, my God, you know, I could be at home now, sitting there having a Sunday dinner. We're actually sitting on board here, 100 foot under the water having your dinner, you know. God knows where you are, miles from anywhere. People will turn around and say, you know, for God's sake, cheer up. You know, you've you got to cheer up yourself, you know, you've got to be cheerful. You've just got to, let, you've just got to knuckle down to it and make it. You've got to make it. Wreckers 250. Anyone's? Three pound. Three pound. Come on, it's a cheap horse after already being won once. Come on, gentlemen. Three pounds. Three pound fifty. Where's that? Three fifty. Any advance on three? Four. Four pound. Four pound. Come on, still a cheap horse. Four pound. Four fifty. Advance four here. Five pounds. <laughs> And again, spin the dice in the air. Come on. You escape from the responsibilities of the bills, the fact that the roof may be peeling off in the last gale. Another 300 pound bill, but we won't worry about that because I ain't got to worry about it. Let the wife worry about it. You accept it, you really don't want to hear about it. Yeah. So we're very selfish, really. You know, leaving everything for them to do. 
You take so much for granted. You don't realise how much till they're gone. Just being here and talking to them, discussing the problems. And when they're not here, you worry about it. Whereas if he was here, I could talk about it and he could say, oh, that's nothing to worry about. The first few days are not too good. They're pretty bad because you're missing them. But then after that, you sort of set on to a routine and just get on with it. Like many wives of Polaris submariners, Dawn Saunders has had to move from her native England to start a new life on the bleak west coast of Scotland, where Repulse is based. I started work in the fruit shop because of John going away. And with the children both being at school, my housework's done by half past nine. And I just couldn't sit and do nothing. We've got an awful lot of customers. And they're so friendly. You get to know them, know their ways, what they like and what they don't like. And a lot of the customers will only deal with me. And I think that's fantastic. That's lovely. Thank you. Juliet Hawke is the wife of Repulse's captain. They met when she was a wren. Come on, girl. There's certainly a pattern to the way our time passes when he's away. At first, it takes a bit of time to settle, and I think we're all a bit sad. Um, and then we brighten up a bit. Then after that, uh, certainly halfway through the patrol, I think we all feel fairly low. It is a lonely time, but I do have quite a lot that keeps me busy. I have three children, um, which inevitably keeps you busy. Uh, I also do quite a lot of outside things. I'm on a thing called the Children's Panel, which is um, rather special to Scotland. Rather like being a JP on the children's bench in England. That I find very interesting, and it gives me something else and somebody else to think about, other people with problems. Um, I'm on the local lifeboat, Ladies Guild, which obviously keeps me quite busy. Yes. Gently. I think one of the worst weeks I've had was getting the two girls back to boarding school because um, the big one had been away for two terms, but Katie, the nine-year-old, hadn't been before. And uh, she found it pretty awful, and I did too, although neither of us got upset. Um, they're at school down in Dorset, which is a long way from here. It's a long journey. We set out very early in the morning. It took me two days to take them there, drop them, and come back again. And I would dearly have loved to have had Mike here when I got back. Um, that, that was quite difficult. Um, but they're both very happy where they are. But it's a long way from home. Being the captain's wife, I think, sometimes can be slightly lonely because um, people are slightly apprehensive of you. I don't go out very much in the evenings because I don't like going out without Mike and I tend to listen to music a lot, um, sit by the fire, which is great company. And in fact, I light it quite often when I don't really need to because I enjoy it. Um, I watch the television and I, I do a lot of sewing. Um, I generally just sit on my own. Oh, very glib of me to say it's no problem. Uh, it's part of balance of being a naval officer. Uh, to me, I've grown up with it over the years, and uh, it, uh, yes, it is a, it is a very sad moment. I think it's more sad for me when I see the sadness in my children's faces than it is for myself personally. Uh, they're always disappointed to see you go away. They're always thrilled to bits when you get back, so that makes up for it. So, uh, on the whole, it really is no major problem. It's one that I've grown up with, and one I accepted when I joined the Navy and then got married. Once a week, every member of Repulse's crew is entitled to receive one personal message from someone in his family. These family grams are just 40 words long, 
and must be a skillful combination of news and reassurance. Hawk, Commander. Tonsils, adenoids out, Rachel fine. Just off to see her. Trunk gone. Heavy storm weekend, house fine. Katie's first riding lesson, great success. Sam delighted to be back at school. No problems here. All miss you. Love, Jules. Family grams are difficult to write. I don't think that 40 words is enough to tell Mike perhaps all that I want to tell him. But I actually find 40 words very difficult to write. Um, you have to be very careful what you put. I wouldn't want to put anything in that would worry him. Although Mike and I do, t I do tell him everything that happens um, because we have that agreement so that he doesn't think he's going to come back to anything serious when he comes home, if anything had gone wrong, um, with Rachel having her tonsils out. I wanted to wait and tell him that I knew they were successfully out before I wrote a family gram, so that he knows that it's all over and done with. Family grams are a strictly one-way communication. They can be a mixed blessing. Wives must remember not to include worrying news about their families. It might prey on their husband's imagination. If they do let any slip through, the Navy will probably censor it out before the family gram is sent. I can't tell them that the children are ill because they'd worry and they wouldn't send it anyway. Um, or any bad news. I can't, I can't tell them about that. Um, I try and keep it light and... Um, it can't be lovey-dovey at all. Why not? But I don't like being lovey-dovey in public. <laughs> Especially when it's read to, you know, um, it's read out and other people read it before it's sent. And to try and tell him everything that's happened and what you're doing and that the children are well, it's pretty awkward because you want to tell him so much and you've got to be careful what you write. You've got to cut out the ands and the buts and narrow it down. Saunders, M-E-M-N-1. No domestic disasters this week, except Moa blew up. Spacers found in pocket. Too late. Dad got to mower first. Lawn looks nice. Roses died in amazement. Having birthday party with 16 assorted brats. Big headache. Love, Dawn. Hello, son. Hope you're getting on well. All the family miss you. Muffin's OK. Went to visit Fran and Bob the other day. Found I got a swimming award. See you soon. Love, Mum and Dad. Dear Colin, had a good holiday in the sky. Weather was good. Dad's nose is peeling. Ha uh ha. -huh. Letter came from Solista about your flat. Bus is on straight again. John phoned. She's fine. Lots of love, Mum and Dad. Darling, the weather's fine. Went over to Maggie's last weekend. The kids are all right and so am I. We're all missing you. Car going in for a service next week. See you soon. Love, Joe. Family grams are important to me because it gives me this feeling that, oh dear, we're not forgotten when we're at sea. You know, in civilization, we're not forgotten. And there's always someone out there thinking about you all the time. You just need them. They're just, otherwise you'd crack up in this sort of this sort of atmosphere. You know, you're, you're stuck in this metal tin. And you, you still need, you need contact. You do look forward to getting them each week. And, you know, if, if they're late, you tend to start, you know, wondering all sorts of things. They're probably, you know, it doesn't matter what... She hasn't done anything, you know, but you start wondering anything and everything. I know he worries that we're all OK, but I know he doesn't worry what I'm going to do or that I'm not going to be here when he comes home. Um, I know he trusts me completely. 
and he knows that I'll always be here waiting for him. Exo, we owe wireless office. Exo, we owe wireless office. The signal has arrived from London to fire Repulse's 16 Polaris missiles. That's my message, sir. Roger. Everyone knows it's only an exercise, but the elaborate procedure is still recorded for analysis later. Mike Reeves is Repulse's senior weapons officer. Opening the safes. The two safes contain the submarine's code books. They will show whether the firing signal is authentic. Reeves is one of only two men who know the combination to this outer safe. Repulse's second in command and the captain himself are the only two people who know the inner safe's combination. So no one person can verify the signal and start the firing sequence. Day. Day 27, page. Page 5. Five. Authenticates. Mine authenticates. Time. Time. 0840. 0840. Both men put their signature on the firing signal to show that it's authentic. Okay. Let's go see the captain. Auto vent inboard. Hey, Mori, our sir, standard launch deck. Standard launch deck. Roger, sir. Captain, sir. Passenger authenticate, sir. Set condition 1SQ. Set condition 1SQ. Yeah. Condition 1SQ will bring the submarine to complete readiness for firing. Scanner report. Specialized auxiliary tanks. Set condition 1SQ. In the missile control room, there's another safe. Access is limited to Reeves and one other officer. A truncheon hangs ready to use on any unauthorized member of the crew who tampers with the lock. It's a very special safe. It contains the trigger that Reeves will use to fire each of the missiles. Print out, sir. Print out, sir. As the target information is fed into the computer, the power and guidance systems of each missile are checked for the last time. Stand by to start hovering. Stand by to start hovering. Speed correct, velocity correct, angle. Stop engine. Stop engine. Start hovering. Start hovering. Start hovering. Hover hull valve open. Hovering in auto computer one. Check control hovering in auto computer one. No shifts, one reset. All missiles spinning, no defects. No defects, one shift. No shift, one reset. One reset. Printouts are verified. Printouts verified, Roger. Captain's printout. Captain's printout. The missiles are primed and targeted. The submarine is motionless in the water. All that Reeves requires is the final authority. Roger. Captain, sir, weapon system in 1SQ. Thank you. The weapons officer has my permission to fire. You have permission to fire. Captain's permission to fire. Roger. Permission to fire. Initiate fire. 10, channel 1. Denote 10. Denote 5. Denote 16. The 16 missiles will be fired individually in a predetermined order. Prepare 10. Each missile has multiple warheads. 48 times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. Ten, Ten away. away. Prepare five. Denote 14. Five, five away. away. Prepare 16. Uh, to carry the nation's deterrent, is, is an exceedingly irresponsible job uh, and must be taken terribly seriously. And I leave that at, at that stage. Uh, from my own point of view, I would be being very silly if I didn't believe in it, doing the job I'm doing now. But my own personal views of actual uh, the morality of the deterrent or the wisdom of the deterrent, I'm afraid I keep personally to myself. Um, I very seldom discuss it with anybody other than my own immediate family. And do you ever, does it ever keep you awake at night when you're on patrol? No, not at all. Not at all? No, not one moment. 
so it doesn't weigh on your mind? No, it does not. While we're actually in the process of the exercise, um, we look at it, I don't think we think about it then, because we're part of the mechanical side of the machine, and we look at it really as a straightforward engineering exercise to, uh, to make the machine that we look after work, because we are all part of the overall machine. And that's, I'm sure, how it would be on the day. The time I do think about it from time to time, I don't think you should dwell on it too much. I don't think anybody should dwell on it too much, but obviously we're, we've got uh, something here that's quite dreadful, but, and it's uh, unthinkable to use it, but uh, at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do, and that's what we would do. Probably if we got the firing signal and they were all discharged, nobody would really hesitate to do that but they would think about it afterwards. I don't think anybody would think about the consequences now if we got a firing signal. Yeah, when a firing signal arrives on patrol, I mean, it's just automatic. I mean, they sound the alarm and everybody just goes and does their job. I mean, for all we know, it might not be an exercise. And I mean, usually they say for exercise, first missile away. I mean, they might not say for exercise this time. And it's just a job. And I mean, a few minutes later, they're all gone, and then I think then you'd sit down and start thinking about it, and then you'd, you'd sort of say, well, what we were here for, we obviously failed to do. We've seen a few films about what would happen if we did use them, or if, if they used theirs, and for what we, we've seen, you know, you, you can't imagine the outcome of it. With, there's never been a war like that before. That's so right. you, you be can't, on such a grand you, scale that you couldn't, you couldn't, you imagine couldn't uh, appreciate the extent of it, I don't think. I tend not to think deeply about it too much. Whereabouts did you see the gun? If, if you did, I think you probably wouldn't be here anyway. If you had that sort of attitude, though, you tend to be um, not unstable, but not the sort of background that they, they really want. I think they look for people probably that uh, don't take it too seriously as. Um, as a warlike situation, or as, as a deterrent, you know, just something to, to show off. Well, I think it's a pretty frightening thought, actually, that uh, you could surface four or five weeks later and there's absolutely nothing left. Um, it's, it's one of them things we try not to think about, but uh, the reason we're doing it is to protect our families and friends at home, and when you think about it, that we're, we've done our part of it, but it's still done us no good because there'll be nothing left at home. The Cat 22 situation. <laughs> Pulse has returned from its silent patrol. And one, surface. Surface, blow forward main ballast. Blow forward main ballast. Blow half the main ballast. Fully open. Keep the right on the door. The submarine's crew must soon adjust to the outside world. Fly off, sir. On the surface, open up. When they left, it was in the bright sun of midsummer. They've returned to the damp morning of a Scottish autumn. Their senses will soon be bombarded with unfamiliar sights and sounds and smells. Oh, yeah. 
smell itself. Uh, I suppose it's like a, it's like the difference between beer and wine. You know, you, you get used to one thing and then you get something totally different. Well, unless you've really experienced it, you know, it's hard really to put it into words. It's a good smell. Definitely a good smell. After, after you've lived with uh, all the loyal men for, for weeks on end, it's definitely a good smell. <laughs> And first tenant's wife and his daughter. Uh, and the oh, chief staker's yeah. wife. Right, number four degrees. Yes. Starboard 15. Starboard 15.